Bienvenue à Parler dans le casse. Avant de commencer, permettez-moi, chers auditeurs et auditrices, d'utiliser ma voix radiophonique du dimanche pour remercier nos généreux commanditaires. Et donc, Parler dans le casse, c'est une présentation de Onsite, une compagnie québécoise qui design, construit et installe des blocs urbains, des centres d'escalade et même la salle de bloc que tu rêves d'avoir chez vous. C'est aussi une présentation de Passe-Montagne, la plus vieille école d'escalade au Québec, qui offre un service d'accompagnement et de perfectionnement aux grimpeurs et grimpeuses de tous les niveaux qui désirent découvrir les falaises de rochers de glace du Québec, que vous soyez à Montréal, dans les Laurentides ou dans le coin de Québec. Pour le douzième épisode de Parler dans le casse, le deuxième épisode enregistré sur la route euh, à Ten Sleep dans le Wyoming. Je m'entretiens avec Louis Anderson euh, et une grande première pour parler dans le casse. C'est le premier épisode euh, qui, se, qui se déroule en anglais. Donc, Louis Anderson, c'est un personnage très important dans la communauté de Ten Sleep. Euh, c'est aussi un, un personnage controversé pour, euh, si vous avez déjà entendu un peu l'histoire récente de Ten Sleep, en ce moment, il y a un, un moratoire sur le développement de nouvelles voies, euh, et ce depuis 2019. Euh, Louis Anderson était au centre de cette, euh, cette controverse-là. C'est un, euh, un développeur régional euh, très prolifique. Il, il a plus de, de 200 voix là, dans le, le canine à son actif dans les, dans les dernières saisons. Et donc, ça l'a euh, fait, euh, fait couler beaucoup d'encre sur les réseaux sociaux, ce qui s'est passé là-bas. Mais en gros, ça a à voir avec l'éthique de, de développement. On a beaucoup parlé de, de, de création de pochettes, là, de manufacturer des prises de chipping là, euh, essentiellement là-bas. Et c'est une conversation que je voulais avoir avec lui, mais je n'étais pas sûr à quel point euh, il serait réceptif à, à en jaser. Et donc, j'avais attendu qu'on soit euh, « off the record », que les micros soient fermés pour, euh, pour entreprendre ça. Et finalement, il, il, ça a été une, une conversation super intéressante que malheureusement, je n'ai pas enregistrée. Mais la leçon dans tout ça, euh, c'était que ce, ce débat-là n'est pas aussi euh, noir et blanc qu'on euh, qu voudrait nous le faire croire. Et donc, c'est beaucoup plus nuancé. Euh, c'est beaucoup plus nuancé que je pensais. Et c'est un sujet là, sur lequel je reviendrai sûrement avec Serge euh, lors d'un prochain épisode. En tout cas, euh, moi j'étais content de pouvoir m'asseoir avec lui, euh, jaser un peu de son histoire comme grimpeur. Ça fait quasiment 50 ans qu'il fait de l'escalade, Louis, euh, et jaser un peu de ses préférences euh, dans l'escalade. On va également jaser de ce qui se passe dans le canyon. Euh, Louis, c'est également le propriétaire du Ten Sleep Rock Ranch, qui est un des... Euh, tu comme on, un hangout de grimpeurs là, qui, est, qui est absolument merveilleux, qui est très accueillant. Euh, c'est vraiment un des plus cool hangouts là, où est-ce que j'ai été. Est, euh, évidemment, c'est un camping, mais c'est aussi une place où est-ce qu'il y a bien des gens qui, qui travaillent euh, tout l'été là-bas là, à distance. Il euh, y a une belle rivière qui passe juste là. En tout cas, tout un endroit. Fait que je parle un petit peu avec lui là, du, euh, de la création de, de cet endroit-là également. Et donc, euh, voilà, une entrevue super intéressante intéressante avec un personnage de Ten Sleep fascinant. Et donc, euh, bonne écoute tout le monde! Here we go. So, Louis, thanks for agreeing to this. Of course. And, uh, well, I guess we're going to start with a short introduction. So okay. Can you tell me who you are, how long you've been climbing, all of that? Okay. Yeah, my name is Louis Anderson. Uh, I've been climbing now for almost 49 years. My dad was a climber, so I got started when I was eight years old. Uh, 56 now, so it's been quite a while. Uh, mostly a sport climber these days. Um, living here in Tin Sleep, that's really all that we have. So there's that. But in the past, I've done just about everything: you know, bouldering, big walls, and mountaineering, ice climbing, sure. track climbing, everything. Gym climbing? Uh, certainly a lot of gym climbing. Yeah, yeah. I think I heard that you're uh, you set for uh, indoor climbing a lot. Mm -hmm. Is that? I do a lot, of, a lot of route setting. I also do handhold design and gym design. I built gyms for about 25 years previously. So, okay. Yeah, very involved in the outdoor industry. Okay, was that or, like sorry, your previous career, I guess? Yeah, yep. mostly. Very cool. And what's your local uh, crag when you grew up? 
So oh, you've been everywhere. Um, we live very close to Joshua Tree and okay. Suicide and Talk Eats Rocks yep. in Southern California. Okay. Yeah. Ah, very cool. Yeah. Yosemite in the summers. Yeah? Some big walling over there? Big walling and tri climbing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ah, very cool. Okay, so uh, what's the most important aspect of a route for you? Like, if we're talking mm. about what makes uh, not exactly the ideal route, but what, you know, what are the characteristics that you look for the most when you're, when you're climbing or when you're developing? I think there's a lot of things. I mean, the general attraction comes from lots of different areas. Um, the aesthetics, the, the setting, the rock quality. Uh, I like longer routes, so I prefer that over short bouldery okay. routes. I mean, they still speak to me, but I prefer longer stamina challenges. Um, I think that the rock quality, diversity of movement, um, I mean, lots of things, the environment generally, if there's a good view from the crag, sure. I'd prefer that. Yeah. yeah. Quality of movements, mm -hmm. quality of rock. All of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And steeper or more vertical? Mm, oh, gosh, um, I've had different preferences over the years. I'm, I'm a little bit older now. My shoulders aren't what they used to be. Mm -hmm. So steep climbing is a little bit more challenging now for me. Um, I think if I had to pick a perfect angle, maybe 25 or 30 degrees over home, oh, kind of in the middle. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You still have to engage with your feet, but there's some power component as well. Okay. And if I asked you, what would be like a route that would kind of encapsulate all of that if you mm. had do you have an example either one of yours or one that you've climbed before something that b brings back like a very like a very good memory of an almost perfect route i think maybe some of the hmm, a single route doesn't really stand out but you know i think of seus um some of the caprice and some of the greek crags um around leonido okay um a lot of spanish crags obviously yep like i said i like the longer routes so Huh, one in particular. I don't know. There's there's one particular wall at Caprici in Greece that's long tufa systems, you know, 30 to 35 foot meter pitches. Um, like enduro. Yeah, just enduro, and you're kind of weaving your way through different tufa systems. Um, I like it because it's not something we have a lot of in the U.S., so it speaks to me more. Um, you know, locally, I like a lot of the crimp and, and pocket climbing, but we have a lot of it here, so they, yeah. they kind of all meld together. Right. So I think something that offers a different experience for me. And I'll, I'll get to that question. Uh, what would be your favorite local crag here or your lo local, like your favorite local sector, I guess, because I mean, mm, so Tin Sleep is pretty, crag. for those of you that haven't been here, Tin Sleep has a lot of pockets and crimps and yep. mostly just off vertical one way or the other technical climbing. Um, there's a sector that's, there's two walls next to each other, Supremacy and Shooting Gallery. Mm -hmm. um, I like them quite a bit because the rock quality is just, some of the best in the canyon. Um, it's not as heavily featured as the rest of the canyon, so it's more pure pocket climbing. Um, okay. It's mostly 512 climbing from 12A to 12D. Um, I think there's maybe 20 routes between the two panels of rock. And it's just a great place to go get a lot of mileage at a uh, somewhat difficult grade, but still attainable. Sure. And basically that, because I looked at it, I haven't uh, been to it yet. You walk from, like, do you start from Powers and then walk down, uh, like, from, from Trump and then end up Yeah, you there? can come that way. There's also a separate parking area and separate approach trail, maybe a half a mile down from okay. Powers Parking. All right. Yeah. I've it's, got... it's closer to town, closer to the Rock Ranch. Okay. I'm super curious about a bunch of little outcrops of rock that I spotted over there that yeah. don't seem like they have any, any roots on them yet. Yeah, that side of the canyon tends to be whiter rock, so it's, it's smoother, it's less, less uh, spiny and sharp. Okay. Um, more reminiscent of maybe wild iris type of climbing. Sure, the black rock, right? Yeah. 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 Very good. Yeah. And all right, favorite destination then, once you're tired of... Crimping mm. and pocketing. Where do you go? Uh, I mean, more crimping and pocketing yeah. in, in Spain, though. <laughs> Spain? <laughs> I love Spain. Yeah. Okay. I used to go every every winter for several years. COVID kind of stopped that that pattern. But yep. my wife and I love going there. We have a lot of friends, um, people we can reconnect with. Um, that type of limestone is probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. You know, I love Sierra and some of the older technical routes. She really loves Margalef, and they're only about an hour and a half away, so okay. we can hit both. Yep, and I heard the scene is very good there. It's very easy to stay. Very like easy. The, the small towns yeah. are, are great. Really, Relatively inexpensive. I mean, the Euro is not as strong as it used to be, so mm -hmm. it's cheaper now for Americans to go there, but generally, even at that, once you get to the smaller towns, it, it's pretty affordable. Yeah. So. Yeah, very cool. The culture too. I like the culture. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm thinking about actually taking a trip there eventually with uh, with my wife, and so we're gonna stay in Barcelona, and then I guess it's a short drive to, to get to depending Sur on where Sur you Juana go over there. Yeah, depending yeah. on where you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's lots and lots and lots of options. Okay. In every direction. 
And how about a place that you've never been? Mm. I was that thinking about like this. Yeah. Um, Turkey, probably. Okay. I really like a lot of the Greek crags. Um, Kalemnos is, is quite good. All the various crags around Leonidio, um, Crete. Mm-hmm. And ju- being just across the Mediterranean, I mean, Turkey has a lot of the same type of climbing. But I don't think it's as developed or visited just yet, so it won't be as crowded. Okay. Kalimnos these days is a little polished and there's a lot of people. Yeah, and so. a lot of the new development is around Leonidios, right? Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Very cool. Place you've never been, we've done. Now we're getting to the spicier questions. Mm-hmm. What annoys you the most at the crag? I'm sure you thought about that mm, one. I did a little bit. Um, it, it's kind of hard because I, I by bolting routes and, and opening up some infrastructure here, I, I kind of am part of the problem in creating this, but it just crowded areas. Okay. You know, I don't mind a lot of people at the crag if everyone's getting along and being being um, friendly towards each other. Sure. But every now and then you get the folks that just kind of show up and take over the crag or maybe they have a dog that's not very well behaved or, yeah. or maybe they as people are not very well behaved. I mean, just, just people that kind of affect everyone else's good experience. Okay. I guess you're able to avoid it relatively easily around here. It's funny because yeah. I saw you at FCR uh, a couple of days ago. Yeah, and it was and quite crowded that day. <laughs> it was super crowded in my reflex. And I was working on something specific, but I mean, I and what happens is that every time I come here, I end up coming here with new people. So mm-hmm. we're like, okay, we're going to tour like the classic crags Correct. and just like just expect people and we'll be fine and all of that. But if I, my thought was if I was sort of hanging around here, I'd end up at all these little remote you know, less crowded. We went to the Ark uh, yeah. one day and it was absolutely awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did not hit a good day there, but I mean, the, the, the crag itself is awesome. I don't think it's ever going to see that many people because of the long approach. A longer approach. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it's pretty easy to avoid the crowds here if you want to. Um, yeah. We also know of several areas that are not yet published, so we can always go there if we have to. Sure. But my wife actually has a project at FCR right now. So, okay. so, ah, we, so yeah. we find ourselves there from time to time. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next one was a cold call, a mistake, something that you, uh, you know, like a negative anecdote. Something. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This one, you know, I, I had a couple of different thoughts and different, different things came to mind. Um, there's two in particular that happened more recently. Um, just last year I was belaying a friend of mine, uh, with a Grigiri, like we all do. Mm-hmm. And he took a pretty good sized fall and the, the Grigiri did not catch. Mm-hmm. And I've been using a Grigri for a long time. I'm quite confident that I didn't do anything wrong. And on closer inspection, once I got him safely back to the ground, I realized that a small little grain of sand was wedged in the cam. And it was kind of stuck in a halfway position. It wouldn't, it wouldn't retract and open back up, and it wouldn't really fully catch either. Okay. Um, so I reached out to Petzl and ended up sending them the device, and they said that this does occasionally happen. Um, they sent me a replacement and sure. we went on. Thankfully, okay. I was wearing gloves that day because it was... Yeah, you were still able to like, still able arrest, arrest the fall. The fall. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. It was a bigger fall than I'm sure they intended it to be. Um, but I was able to stop it and everything was fine. Okay. But it was just kind of one of those fluke things. I think oftentimes we all just assume that our equipment's going to work perfectly the way it ought to every single time. And, and I think that especially a device like a Grigri, where you can take for granted that it's almost a, a standalone device, you know, yeah. there's still some skill involved. But it's funny, I don't anymore. I have, uh, it's, it's funny you would talk about this. I have a Grigri that I'm thinking of sending back to Pedzl. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used it a lot for, uh, for bolting. Okay. And so I did a lot of uh, rappel with it on fixed ropes. And I realized after a while that it never completely locked mm. like it's and, and then uh, at the beginning of the season i was able to lower uh like a friend without using the lever at all hmm. so i would just like be on the brake hand and i would lower the guy just if it was like an atc yeah that's that's troubling yeah very troubling so i retired it and i had another one already but i've been thinking about sending it their way see what, see what they say about it they were they, they took it very seriously i didn't feel like they poo-pooed the situation they were they really took it seriously and right. and did some research and wanted to look at the device and they tried to recreate the situation couldn't get to happen but mm-hmm. um, apparently it has happened before so i'm sure they'd probably be interested in hearing about it yeah exactly i yeah. Probably should probably do it yeah i also had another interesting situation yeah, go ahead this season um that i was leading something and i as i was passing the bolt that i had previously clipped the little finger loop that you use on the back of your shoe to help you pull on your shoe yeah i uh, clipped into the quick draw <laughs> And so my okay. foot is at the bolt level. I can't proceed further ahead. And you can't, you don't want to fall really fall either. Really. No, so luckily I was wearing slip on shoes that day. I was able to just slip the shoe off and then take a fall and deal with it. But okay. it was just something I never thought would happen. 
That's pretty, yeah, that's very it's unique. really unique. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, yeah, because if you had fallen, like completely lost control, that could have been bad. Oh, it would have been, yeah, I almost certainly would have slammed my head in the rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. So you read the next question. The next question is because, you know, we always meet people who've never climbed before mm. and they always say, you know, oh, you know, you're a climber. So you want to climb Everest. Right. Would you climb Everest uh, if you were given the opportunity? Probably not. When I was younger and I was doing more mountaineering and backcountry ice climbing and things like that, it probably would have appealed to me more. Um, it doesn't appeal to me at all anymore. I'm pretty much a fair weather climber now. Yep. But more than that, just everything I see online as far as how crowded it is and yeah, I was going to ask. Just yeah, all of that. I was, I was it just doesn't. Is it more of an ethical team. sort of standpoint, or it's both? Like I guess you, both. Yeah, yeah, both like, like mountaineering is not your thing. And, no, not really anymore. And if it were, it probably wouldn't be Everest either. No, um, I just feel like if I was to do that type of climbing, what I've seen online anyway um, about recent Everest experiences, it's just not something that speaks to me at all. No, it doesn't. I'd rather me. go to a remote peak, regardless of the height, and just have a better, sure. pure, pure experience. So, all right, yeah. sounds good. Now, last question. Last question, I didn't write it down. It was either like like a, a debate or a controversial aspect of climbing that you are especially interested in, something that you, you like thinking about. I would say this one's pretty easy. I would say more stewardship. You know, I've been climbing a long time now and been involved in bolting and development of crags for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we end up, as a byproduct of that, we end up doing a lot of caretaking for the crag, you know, a lot of trail building and trash pickup and yep. whatever that might look like. Um, and I see a lot of people that just show up to the climbing area and, and treat it as though it's just another climbing area or maybe an outdoor version of the climbing gym. And mm -hmm. they don't really think about everything that goes into keeping the area clean and access open and all of that. They just, to some degree, take it for granted. And yep. I would just like to see people a lot more involved in actually taking care of their areas. How do we do that? I think getting involved in the local uh, climbing coalitions, you know, volunteering for service projects. Um, yeah. The climbing coalition here does a lot of trail building projects. Yep. Um, we do highway cleanups. Simple, simple things that you can get involved with. Um, myself and a few of the other people that are local, we are very involved in replacing old anchors um, mm -hmm. as they wear uh, bolts that have gone bad over the last 30 years. But more than that, just you know, top anchors that are grooved and dangerous, um, you know, things like that. Um, I think that if you can't actively involve yourself in doing the work, you can donate money to the climbing coalitions. You know, there's other ways that you can be a part of the, the solution, I think. Yeah. I mean, because the question, uh, I get that, and it's the same in Quebec where we have a core of uh, very involved uh, volunteers uh, who will do the trail work, who will do the rebolting. But the question is always, how do you raise awareness with the visiting climbers, especially mm -hmm. here, since you probably don't have a lot of local climbers. No, we don't. Uh, so how do you raise awareness with the, the climbers visiting? Because we get everything, right? At our local crags, we get people saying, oh, I thought you were paid to bolt this, or mm -hmm. I, I thought you were paid to uh, do the trail work and everything. Right. And then when they realize that it's all like just volunteer work and that, uh, like most of the bolts or like some of the bolts are paid by the Federation, but a lot of the bolts are paid by the volunteers as well mm -hmm. and the equipment and all of that. They're always very surprised. Right. And sometimes they've been climbing for years and they, they're just not aware. Yeah, so we get the same here. So how do you raise awareness? I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Like, how do you go from, because, I mean, you can't get everybody to get involved with the, you know, with the coalition, with the organization. Mm -hmm. So... I think you also can't really, <clears throat> you can't really take the stance of trying to, gosh, how to word it. Um, I don't think you should really look for accolades when you're doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Like I, I do this work because I care about the area. I do this work because it needs to be done and, you know, I have the time and ability and knowledge to do it. Um, I won't want just anyone up there with a drill replacing a bolt. You know, you want to make sure it's done properly. Yep. So um, I don't, I would say that in one way that you can raise awareness is to post about it, you know, whether that be at the climbing area or campgrounds or trailheads or social media, whatever, show that this is an activity that's being done mm -hmm. um, and, and is needed to be done. Um, so there's that. I think it, it, there's a fine line between doing that, though. I've also seen people that do these types of activities and they're actively asking for money all the time to support the effort. Yep. And that doesn't really speak to me. Um, like, I don't think the individual should be asking for money. It's more about the federation or the coalition. Or it's a slippery slope, though. Like, yeah. we, we have uh, <clears throat> subventions sometimes for, for things like that mm -hmm. where you end up being paid. And, and I've always felt like it's a slippery slope because it sets, a, like, a precedent. And right. after that, then you can have people who are, expect to be paid for 
for these kinds of exactly. things. Do you feel like you have uh, like a next generation of uh, climbers who will be interested mm. in rebolting and or bolting new areas? I think so. I mean, we've got a couple of different groups here in the United States that support this activity. Um, the American Safe Climbing Association will oftentimes provide hardware to people that are doing this work mm -hmm. or, or to groups that are doing this work. So I think that that helps. Um, it's a lot easier to get into it because you aren't paying for everything yourself. Yep. Um, for several years, we did pay for it ourselves. It was just something that had to be done. So I'm glad to see that there's some infrastructure and some support in place for that. And I think that makes it easier for other people to get involved. Um, as far as development, um, I, it's a very small percentage of the climbing community that has an interest in doing it. Because it's climbing days. That's what I've yeah. realized. A lot of people, uh, we, we have lots of people in, in Quebec who end up do, uh, doing the, the training who learn how to do it. And then they realize how much work it is and how few, you know, climbing days they actually have. Right. And, and then it goes out the door, you know? I yeah, I think it has, to, it's a certain mentality that finds satisfaction in opening new routes. Um, for whatever motivation that might be, you know, for me, it's it's seeing people have fun on, on things I've created. Sure. Um, it also, I think, in, in areas where you've got certain walls or certain crags that are really overcrowded, it helps spread people out. Yep. Um, which can be good or bad. You know, it's nice to, to limit the impacts in one area, but you're also in some ways introducing impacts to other areas that might not have had it. So True. I think there's a lot of responsibility to think about what you're doing when you do it. And is there like a mentorship, uh, not exactly a program, but is there like a form of mentorship going on when you have new climbers coming in who'd be interested in, uh, in so. do, doing your routes? I think so. Maybe not here, but other areas I've been involved in that's happened. Okay. Um, like you mentioned, we don't have a lot of local climbers here. There's only two of us that live in town um, and maybe another dozen or, or so that live within an hour or two. Okay. So, so Tin Sleep was almost all visiting climbers. Yeah. Um, and over the time that Tin Sleep's been an active crag, you know, we'll have people bolt from around the world and, and that's good. But what ends up happening is there's no standardization of hardware being used. There's no standardization of grades. You know, someone yeah. comes here with their own idea of what 510 is and they rate something 510 and maybe here it's 511 or 59. Who right. Knows, you know? Yeah. Not only that, but then you, you have these people who aren't available when there's like rebolting, uh, you know, required and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a burden, a, a heavy burden placed on just a few individuals here. Yeah. Um, so what I've come to understand is that a lot of the like the root developers from the previous generation they they're not around anymore. A lot of them have moved or have had kids or Correct. like are just like a lot busier than they yeah. used to be. And in some cases, those original developers weren't even local at the time. Mm. They would just come here for a month or two, two months every summer, okay. and then go back to their life wherever that life was. Okay. Um, yeah. We've never really had a strong local community. Okay. And do you feel like you have, like, yeah, you've mentioned the American Safe Climbing Association, but mm -hmm. you feel like you'll have the support that you need in a couple of years when all that rebolting will become like heavier so. and heavier? I think so. Yeah. The, the local group is called the Bighorn Climbers Coalition, yep. and they have um, a tangent group called um, the Bighorn Anchor Initiative, and they actually have funds that are allocated for hardware and for route development. Okay. Not route development, I should say route replacement. Yeah, route mostly, bolts yeah. And anchors okay. and things like that. And it's fairly well-funded. Um, the ASCA provides the hardware, so there's not a whole lot of cost involved overhead. Okay. It really just comes down to the labor force. Like sure. I said, it takes climber days. You know, if, yeah, if exactly. I want to go out climbing and I only have one or two days a week to climb, let's say, um, and I choose to spend it doing that, well, that's a day that I won't be climbing. That's right. So a lot of people are not willing to volunteer their time, even if they are qualified. Okay. So you think the way it's going to work once the, the, the climbing management plan is in place is uh, that the... Uh, the Bighorn Climbing Coalition will be able to uh, provide the gear for rebolting. New routes will be out of pocket mostly. Well, new routes will be out of pocket. Yeah, I don't. I don't ever see that being compensated. Okay. Um, I think all of the funds available and the hardware available is for rebolting. Rebolting. Yeah, which is, I guess, again, the most important. Yeah. Uh, you know, keeping the Correct. routes uh, safe. Yeah, and and we also don't have. I mean, there's always so many visiting climbers that show up um, and want to develop something here. I, I know you develop routes back home, so. Yep. If that's in place when you come back next time, you know, I hope that you'll add some routes as well. Um, and there's other people that want to do that. Yeah. But there's only a, a few of us that live, you know, relatively close by that have an interest. Mm. So no, I'd really like to do that. I'd like to come back and do a bit of half, like to have a like a, like a few like rebolting missions, mm -hmm. and then like take an interest in maybe like a new sector, so that I feel like I'm contributing. Yeah, like both sides of it. It's like a good that. way to give back for sure. I think so. Yeah. You know, and there's because just there's add, adding your roots is adding like you know like extra work for uh, yeah. 
Whatever. I mean, assuming <laughs> assuming that you're using proper hardware and you do a good job, sure. you know, it's going to last a long time. Yeah. Um, we're primarily focused on the, the things that have been there for 25 or 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And originally were developed with poor hardware. Yeah. Or they've just worn out over time. Um, yeah, I think most of the people that have been doing new routes lately have been using nice hardware and the appropriate hardware. Mm -hmm. So, All right. So uh, I know because I've read all the introductions to all the guidebooks that uh, you know there's no point in dwelling on the past. <laughs> Correct. But uh, there is a you know there's been a climbing ban for the last couple of years, and mm -hmm. now there's a climbing management plan. Correct. That's coming. I'm interested in that climbing management plan more than like figuring out whatever happened. Okay. But uh, because it's it's interesting, right? So there haven't been any new routes added for the last couple of seasons. Right. Since and it, since 2019. Okay, and it seems like maybe <clears> next year. Year or in, like the season after that, you might have, uh, you know, you, we might be able to start Correct. Uh, adding your roots again. Yeah, we're hopeful that it will be next season. Um, there's a lot of different components to the climbing management plan. Development is just one small part of it. Um, they're also looking at uh, trail mm -hmm. rerouting, um, erosion control, you know, signage at the trailheads. Um, if you've seen the parking in the canyon, we're primarily using emergency pullouts that aren't really intended for parking. They're right. intended for yeah. cars that are overheating or things yeah, like or that. Tourism, like or a tourism, like a lot of yeah. Yeah, RVs. So there's look, they're looking at adding new parking areas. Um, there's a pretty substantial plan in place to build an off-highway parking area at the Mondo parking area okay. that would also include bathroom facilities yeah. and trash facilities. Um, all of those types of things, I think, are the more um, immediate concerns mm -hmm. that the climate management plan will help with. Um, the Forest Service, who's the governing body here, they have kind of decided that they don't want to implement any aspect of the climate management plan until they can implement the, the plan on the whole. The whole thing, yeah. Right. So, that takes so time. Yeah. it might be next season. It more than likely will probably be late next season or beginning of the following season. Okay. And I was going to ask, I'm curious about the, the free camping up on the old road. Is mm -hmm. this something that's uh, safe for the future? Or is I that, think so. Yeah, I think so. It's part of the... Um, Part of it's part of the discussed. management plan. Uh, they're also looking at possibly enlarging, not enlarging, but offering other options for dispersed camping. Okay. Uh, as you drive onto the old road now, there's a paved section at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And over the recent years, people have just started parking along the, the side of the road. Or worst case, they're driving into the bushes and creating a new parking area. Right. Um, because of the proximity to the high, highway and also to the creek, um, there's some concern about polluting the water system. Mm. I suspect that those lower canyon areas will go away. Right. Um, yeah, because it's, uh, I don't know if it's the same, but in Canada or, well, everywhere, right? It's a hundred feet from any yeah. uh, body of water or Yeah, I don't remember the water. particular limitations yeah, here, but there, there is a, a separation from the highway and also from the waterway. Okay. Um, and none of those sites are compliant. Right. So the conversation I've had with the forest rangers locally is that the more established sites will probably remain. Yep. And the ones that can be easily um, recovered and, and put back to their natural state will be. Right. So some of those lower canyon spots that are the most convenient, maybe the most widely used, those will certainly go away. But the ones that are up on the forest proper past the gate, mm -hmm. um, I think all of those are safe. Yeah. And maybe like identified and numbered. Most and of like them are signed already and numbered, um, but they, they're also well within the distance requirements from the water. Okay. So there's, cool. they're safe. And, and while we're, if you don't mind, while we're talking of, of camping, you've built here like one of the coolest hangouts. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad for, to hear that. Well, because I've been to many of them, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's an especially uh, welcoming place in, in the sense that even when you're not a camper, uh, you know, you can use the facilities, mm -hmm. uh, you can take a shower, you can use the Wi-Fi, and the whole thing uh, depends on the honor system. It does. And yeah. so how does it work? Does it work well? Um, do you feel like, how, how do you? I think it does. I mean, there's a couple of different ways to look at it. If I really tried to capture every dollar that came through this place, then it's probably a failure. Right. Um, but that was never our intent when Valerie and I decided to open the campground. The primary focus was to provide some infrastructure for climbers um, to maybe lighten the impacts on the forest. Mm -hmm. Because before we opened up, you know, you would have a thousand plus people yeah. just trying to camp in the forest somewhere. Exactly. Everybody was trash. Here. You know, there was some bathroom facilities, but not too many, certainly not enough for that, num that number of people. Um, trash was left everywhere. It was a bit of a mess. Um, and we really care about this area. We wanted to try and offload some of that impact. Mm -hmm. Um, we also do charge for camping here. We do charge for showers. Um, yeah, but it's cheap and it, it's, we try to keep it an affordable cost. Um, 
And with that comes the interest in other people that might be climbing in the forest or passing through to take a shower, to dispose of their trash, to if they work remote, they need an internet connection. And we don't really want them just parking in front of the restaurants in town and taking up all of the all of the available parking, which was yep. happening. Um, so we just decided we'd rather allow those people to come as well. And the, creek, and the creek is here. We tried to develop a nice yeah, it area is. to hang out and swim and it's things be, like it's that. It's beautiful. So, yeah. Well, congrats on that. I'm I mean, glad it's working. Yeah, yeah. it's very, it's, yeah. We, and, we never intended for it to be a commercial enterprise, but even from a commercial standpoint, it's become a success. Mm -hmm. So we're getting out of it what we need to. And more than that, I think we're also helping. And it probably makes the municipality, like the Tent Sleep uh, town, happy as it well. Does. Because it does. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. probably had problems with like overnight camping. Very and, much so. Yeah. People, people used to shower, quote unquote, in the bathrooms at the park and, yep. and things like that. Um, the city workers would empty the trash in the morning and come back an hour later and the trash cans were full. And it just, it, our town is very small and it's not really <laughs> built to handle this. Yep. Um, you know, we're a town of about 250 and in the summertime, there's an influx of a thousand people that look different and act different and dress different. And they just mm -hmm. don't really know what's going on. So there was a lot of misunderstanding and, and, you know, bad feelings with mm -hmm. the town folk. And I think now that we've been here for a while and spoken to all the people in the town, there's a lot more appreciation for the climbers and what they do bring to the local. It seems obvious. Yeah, it seems obvious when yeah. we go and when we have dinner over there. And, you know, like I always make a point of having like one dinner at the Sleepy Coyote. And mm -hmm. then we went to the saloon yesterday Correct. and we had a really good time. Yeah, we do so. the same. We have preferences, but we try and support all the local businesses. Yep. So. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. It's almost kind of off the record, but I mean, okay. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm interested in coming back here okay. and, uh, and, and maybe adding your roots eventually. Now, what happened? To, did, is it east and western sides of the canyon, or do you say north and south? Mostly? It's, it's kind of because it's, it's, in it's di kind of in the diagonal. Middle. Yeah, it's right, kind of in exactly. the middle. I, I would say it's what uh, I guess to be northeast and and uh, northwest, maybe. I mean, it's a slightly different orientation, right, right, okay, but exactly. basically we have shade on the right side of the canyon in the mornings till the early afternoon and shade in the left side of the canyon yeah. uh, coming from town right. uh, in the afternoon. So yeah, so the east side of the canyon is the one that gets morning shade. Correct. And that side of the canyon seems to me underdeveloped. I agree. Okay. Is there a reason you think why? Like, um, because I've been looking at some sectors and then it's funny because I took a picture and I wanted to show you the picture. And then I looked at your guidebook and started trying to figure out like all the lower Canyon crags. Mm -hmm. And then I figured out that for two seasons, I've been looking at a uh, cell tower. <laughs> uh, and then I figured, oh, there are two routes. And I'm like, and this looks like bullet good stone, That's very good. Yeah. no approach. Uh, or you know, very small. I'm just curious why it I never know. attracted the, I don't the attention of, um, because you've walked it. You have I, a roof over I've there. I walked the entire canyon. Yeah, yeah. and it's 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 good rock, right? It's very good rock. I think it's better rock than the west side. So um, why? I think that there was just a, as a system of momentum that happened. Some routes were added on the west side, in the bottom of the canyon, and people just kind of had it in their mind that that was what should be climbed. And okay. they just started at the bottom and worked their way up. And okay, so th th there's it, no reason in the sense no. that, oh, it's less accessible, no, no, or no. maybe the, the base is not as welcoming. Or... No, they're generally shorter approaches. Yeah. Um, you okay, know, so I'm not crazy. The old road is closed a good chunk of the year. Sure, okay. But by the middle of June, it's open. Yeah. Most of the climbing season, it's open. Okay, so there's still a ton of good routes. A lot, a lot. I'm not crazy when no. I... Because I was looking either, also at the around the cheese pillar, mm -hmm. Where and I'm like, okay, there are like just a handful of roots on this thing, but there's yeah. plenty of good stuff. Yeah, there was one climber that used to live in Warland, which is about a half an hour away. Mike Decker, he still lives there, but he doesn't climb anymore. Okay, and he did a lot of exploratory bolting all up and down the canyon. And I've come across random single routes or partially developed routes mm. on the entire east side. Right, on all of the on all of the major formations, he's wrapped down and kind of taken a look at things. Okay. And some oh. of the, some of my favorite routes that I've bolted here are on that side. Right. So, well, yeah, it looks really good because I spotted that the cell tower uh, part, and then like around the cheese pillar, it looks like it just goes left, and there's Correct. almost nothing going on. Yeah. Uh, and lower down from like you started going down, right? Like Powers, and then Trump, and mm -hmm. then but still, you know, there's, there's still a lot to do. Yeah, and even across from there's Lake Creek, and then across from it, there's a little outcrop of rock that looks super interesting, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. like like not too big. Okay, so that answers this. Now, my other question, I'm sure there's an easier answer to that one. When, when you leave the Rock Ranch, mm -hmm. as soon as you drive towards Tensley, you have a massive <laughs> wall in front of you. Right. Like, I mean, massive. Yeah, yeah it's all sandstone and it's very soft. Okay, yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. I've hiked up to it and there was a guy 
gosh, we're going back maybe 10 years that tried to bolt a route on it yeah. and all of the bolts just pull out. Okay. I mean, if you were to develop it, you would have to do a significant amount of work um, cleaning. You'd probably have to use very long glue in bolts. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the holes just deteriorate. It's, right. it's okay. just too soft. Yeah, yeah. Because it it's, impress- it's impressive. It's impressive, yeah. yeah. But the, I figured because then it's red and I'm like, ah, it's red. It's probably yeah. got like very soft sand. There's also, like if you deep. hike up there on the, the right most extreme of it, there's a, a fair amount of Indian artwork. Uh, okay. From the natives that yeah. used to live here, and so even if Plus it I was to be it's climbed, private land, all that so everything actually the, the, the is, bottom portion of it is is public. Okay. Um, it's just not very, it's not appealing once you actually get up to it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Well, thanks, Louis. Of course, it was uh, it was it was great. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank all you right. for having me on. Thank you.